welcome to the fifth seminar in our history of philosophy class. From Heraclitus to Echo, we're sort of ending, uh, moving towards the end of our journey here. We've come a long way from Heraclitus. Today, we're going to talk about the consequences of the great mystery, uh, the world historical figure, the end of history, and the will to power. And these are all terms that were introduced by uh, G.W.F. Hegel and W.F. Nietzsche. Uh, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel and Wilhelm Friedrich Nietzsche, lots of people in the 19th century in Germany were named Georg Wilhelm Friedrich. So that was, that was why. Um, of course, the course materials are available out there. Do we need to go to the website to take a look and see how to get it, or is everybody okay with that? I was in there and I, there were so many with the same name and I couldn't figure out which website should I go to it. Oh, okay. Well, hold on a second then. We'll take a look at it. Um, okay, so it's narrowgatealliance.org. Mm -hmm. Okay, so narrowgatealliance.org. Alliance, that's what it is then. Okay. So just, yeah, then once you get here, you'll just uh, move the cursor over to the, and just hold it over the NKA Seminars tab. And then here's the history of philosophy. And then here are all of them in order, basically. So today's PowerPoint presentation is at the bottom. Okay, and then we just, you, you can download it by right-clicking and save, uh, uh, save link as. Okay, or you can just double click on it here, it'll open up a new tab, and, and then you can download it from here as well. Okay, by coming over here and just clicking on the save file. All right, any questions about that? All right. <coughs> oh, well. So, uh, scheduling note, we'll be in hiatus next week again, so our, uh, on the 22nd. So our next seminar is on Monday, October 29th. So that'll be the sixth seminar. Then we'll be off a month, and we'll meet again on November 26th for the seventh seminar, and then the following week on uh, December 3rd for the final uh, seminar number eight. So not, not meeting next week, meeting the following week, and then we have a month off. All right, so let's review where we are. Uh, seminars one through four will be the ancient mystery religions through Immanuel Kant, roughly 6,000 BCE to 1804 CE. So remember this, everything here, everything, all of our religions, all of our science, all of our literature, all, everything begins with the ancient mystery religions. Okay, that is the source of every single cultural artifact that we possess. Okay, and they were based on secret initiation rites, what we would call today psychodramas. We will see an example of those in, next, in two weeks in the next seminar. Uh, they believe that the, they believe that based on their own experiences that the immortal soul is here for training. And they use various training methods, athletic, gymnastic, yoga, tai chi, meditation, hypnosis, the psychodramas. Uh, you know, just standard educational techniques for concepts and linguistics and language and terminology. Um, they believe that this training was necessary in order safely to travel to the underworld and back. Okay? This is their concept of practicing death. For them, it was a mythological representation of practicing death was the journey to the underworld and then back. Usually carried out by some <coughs> god, demigod, or... Um, Half God, half human person like Hercules, Hercules. All right. So they had, from their own experience, from the meditation, from the hypnosis, from the psychodramas, they had the experience of the two worlds: the world of the spirit, the ideas, the forms, the soul, the afterlife. All of those terms refer to that world, uh, the immaterial world, and the world of matter. Okay. Knowledge basically is the bridge between the two worlds. Knowledge is what we use to describe the two worlds in general and also to bridge between the two. So knowledge is represented and uh, conveyed by mythology, poetry, music, ritual, psychodrama, and divine revelation in the ancient mystery religions. 
That's how the knowledge was conveyed. That is, if you wanted to learn how to do all of these things, they would present you with myths, they would teach you with poems, they would use music, they would do the ritual, the psychodrama, and then they would also have divine revelations which would instruct you as well. Okay? So this was the way that their knowledge of the two worlds was conveyed to newcomers. All right? And in 325 CE at the First Council of Nicaea, all the ancient systems, all right, the ones from Persia, uh, the Hebrew systems from Jerusalem, the Babylonian, the Egyptian, the Greek, the Roman, the Gnostics, all of them were subsumed under Christianity until they caught in the 17th century. Okay, so basically in the Western world, it took all of that and just lumped it all into Christianity. If it was orthodox, then it was kept. If it was unorthodox, it was declared a heresy and destroyed. That's such a large because of the whole trying to unify it. Yes. Trying to drop it into all Christianity, that is where they all go murders and uh, Yes, all of the all, exactly the crusades <laughs> and all of that other stuff yeah, crusades, that right. was going on there. Okay? Greek rationalism and the practice of reason, which we get in Heraclitus, Parmenides, uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, is suppressed. <laughs> Deliberately suppressed. Because they do not want reason. What they want is myth, poetry, music, these kinds of things, so religious kinds of things. All right, with Descartes, however, a return to the Greek concept and practice of reason as the source of knowledge is begun. So Descartes wants to eliminate the uh, grasp on the conveyance and investigation of knowledge from the religious groups and put it back in the hands of rationalism. Greeks. All right, so there's an abandonment of religion as a source of knowledge. So mythology, poetry, music, ritual, psychodrama, revelation, all of that is now cast aside by the modern philosophers. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Many of them historic, the fact that for, you know, 1,100 years, the church had had a stranglehold on knowledge, and there had been no progress in that 1,100 years. None. No progress whatsoever. Essentially, we were still living at the same level of culture as we were back in 400 CE. So that was part of it. Um, this was the inception of the Age of Enlightenment, where the physical sciences, mathematics, and logic, psychology, and the Industrial Revolution all began to flourish. As a result of this turn back to the rationalism of the Greeks, and away from the revelation of the religions. And I think because of this last portion, um, fate come up, fade away. Fate? Oh, uh, yes, the concept of fate, yes, because that is a religious. And all the science yeah. and mm -hmm. psychological yep. and everything, and, but some areas, so, some, some power, they kind of go back and forth because it's not so clear each act is as it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what, what will happen, what we will see next time is that there is a, the religious part of this whole equation has gone underground, mm -hmm. okay? So what we have is we have, we basically have um, a complete separation at this point of uh, reason and versus revelation, but the revelation part of it, the ancient mystery practices are still there, they're just not not explicitly brought into any of the philosophical or historical or scientific works, even though they're there. Occasionally we get glimpses of them, yeah. all right? But, but they're here, they're hidden, they're occult, they're occulted, um, even though they're still being practiced by these same people, okay? But there is this change. So, ra Western rationalism um, um, is the analysis of the relation between spirit and matter. Okay, a rational analysis of the relation. Descartes said there are two substances which we can demonstrate. Res extensa, this kind of stuff, and res cogitans, us. Okay, spirit, the old word for spirit. Spinoza said, wait a minute, I want to focus on the material aspects of this. And he said that, that everything is material, including God. God equals nature. So there is no immaterial kind of a being out there who ha who's running everything in the background anymore. 
what we have is the, the transfer of the concept of God from that kind of a, you know, uh, uber father, this over father kind of nature. figure, into nature. Nature is God, sort of the pantheistic kind of view, although I wouldn't say that Spinoza was pantheistic. He's materialist. God is nature. All right? There may be no self-consciousness in this natural God. Uh, like there is in the ancient concept of God as an immaterial you know, intelligence. Leibniz talked about windowless monads. He's trying to describe the relationship between uh, race cogitans and race extensa. And since the two are separate, it's kind of difficult without some kind of third party intermediate. So he said, what's going on here is that we all have our own experiences, and um, those are the experiences of this windowless monad. The experiences are created by the mind of God, by nature, okay? And it is harmonized by the mind of God. So we're running around in these invisible, tight, um, you know, windowless monads, out of which nothing can escape and into which nothing can come, and it's all sort of coordinated and simulated by the mind of God, which is the natural world. So he actually goes by feeling. No, not by feelings. Everything we have, every experience we have is real to us, but there is no need for any communication among the windowless monads. Yeah. That's taken care of by the mind of God, which translates into the laws of nature. Okay, so we don't have to, he's trying to, he's trying to, uh, he's trying to address certain problems with the Cartesian system that were raised by Spinoza. Namely, how does this you know, non-material kind of substance interact at all with this material world. Okay? I mean, even if there were these two things, they could have no knowledge of one another, and so on and so forth. So it runs into logical problems at the time, and he's trying to address that by saying, yeah, that's no problem. We are windowless monads. But the laws of nature allow us to sort of interact with one another seamlessly as if it were one big material world. Okay? So that is what he's doing. So individual spirits, the monads, whose experience of the material world is simulated and coordinated by the mind of God, the laws of nature. Barthi said, well, you know, this is all well and good, but the only knowledge we have is the knowledge we get from our five senses. Okay? So to be, for anything, is to be perceived by a human being or by some consciousness. All right? To be is to be perceived. So he said everything is ideal. And so he's trying to put it back in terms of the psychology, basically, of our experience. Okay? Questions about that? Now, David Hume is going to follow on in this discussion, and he's going to sort of say, okay, uh, we can agree that there are two substances. Um, we can agree that every piece of data that we have comes from the empirical data that we get through our five senses. And so what we have to do is we now have to take a look at how much information we can really get from that empirical information. So empiricism is the reliance upon our sense data in order to understand the laws of God, the laws of nature, the laws of man. Okay? And since we know just from our own experience that that is limited, we have to sort of put up with those limits. And one of those limits can be demonstrated pretty easily, and he sort of attacks the idea of causation. And he says, look, we can demonstrate that the law of cause and effect isn't really a law. What it is is a custom. We behave as if there were cause and effect. And the reason why, even though we can't demonstrate it. Because even though every time I you know, hit a pool ball you know, with another pool ball, it seems to go off and do all of these things that can be mathematically demonstrated, I cannot prove from that demonstration that it will happen tomorrow. And he's right. There's no way to demonstrate that. Absolutely no way to demonstrate. So he's saying cause and effect is a customary thing. We adopt it because it's useful. All right? So this is the beginning of sort of a pragmatic idea. And he says, why do, we, why do we assume that it's useful? Because it's psychologically necessary for us. So there's something in the human mind that requires us to believe in cause and effect. Whether it can be proven or not is irrelevant. Can I have to be adapted, right? Well, we have to adapt to to the conditions of the world, and one of the ways we adapt to that is by these customs. One of, you know, there's several of them, uh, but the one that is most important is this concept of cause and effect. Okay? 
So he becomes the first of the modern psychologists talking about knowledge and sense data only. Now remember that Plato said the true knowledge only comes from the forms. It comes from the world of the spirit. Now what these guys are saying is, no, 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 no. It comes from the world of material world. That's where it comes from. And it comes to us through our senses. Okay? Now, this is not necessarily a movement away from Plato. What it is is a clarification of that. <laughs> All right? We're still, we're still dealing with this concept of race extents and race capitans. What they're saying is our experience, the empirical world in which we live, um, operates the following way. And that's what Hume is trying to say. He's just trying to describe the way that it's working. Okay, now Kant, following Hume, you know, reads Hume and says, wow, this is a really big challenge. This is a challenge to everything. If we can't have certain knowledge, if everything that we think is certain is only custom and is only adopted because it has some utility, even if it has a psychological validity, we're in big trouble because we have no certain knowledge at all. No certain knowledge of anything. And so in that kind of absolute skeptical world where we can't determine anything for sure, we would be lost, we would be adrift, and we wouldn't have any groundedness to us. It's a word persuasion in psychology. Mm -hmm. Well, no, we're not talking about psychological persuasion here. We're talking about ontology. We're talking about the substance of reality, what's real. Right. Okay? Not what I can convince you is real, but what is really real. And now and then, that's what it is. No, <laughs> it's not, though. The perception is not reality. Okay, that is a, that is a, what is that? That is a, uh, <laughs> that is a slogan that comes to us from Propaganda, the book written by Edward Bernays. Mm. Okay, 1920, published in 1920. Edward Bernays says, to all of you people out there who want to manipulate the masses, this is the rule, perception equals reality. If we can change their perception of something, we will change the world in which they live. Okay, we won't change the ontological structure of the world. We will just change the way they behave in that world. Mm -hmm. Okay? So he's not making an ontological claim, he's making an, a, an epistemological claim. All right? He's not changing the structure of the world, he's changing our structure of our beliefs mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that world. Okay? So we're still dealing with ontology here. We're dealing with what is actually, fundamentally, provably, demonstrably real. Without ontology, without, what, without knowing what is ontologically real, we have no ground on which to stand. We can't exercise our reason because we don't have any first principles that we can rely on. If we don't have first principles that can be demonstratively proven, certainly, have certain knowledge, then we are basically in trouble. So and that was the challenge that Hume said. We can't prove any of those things that we thought were fundamental first truths. Um, and so Kant is trying to, uh, trying to address that problem, ontologically speaking. Okay, now his is an epistemology. He's constructing the first epistemological theory that will get us back on solid ground so we can continue doing ontology. Um, so experience is organized by the a priori categories of understanding. So he's taking his clue from Hume and saying, yeah, there are psychological factors here, but it's not just psychological factors. Um, it is bigger than that. The psychological factors derive from some um, prior existent categories that are necessary for the actual structure of the world. Okay, and those are the categories of space and time, uh, you know, material and non-material. Those are the big categories that organize our experience. And he is saying these are not just psychological necessities for human beings. They are ontological structures of the actual world. Okay, now he then breaks, breaks down the two kinds of experiences that we can have, two kinds of objects that we can encounter. A phenomenon is an object that shows itself to the five senses. Race extensa. Okay, so Descartes' race extensa now become phenomena. All right, so we don't, again, we're in the empiricist model. All we're looking at is what we can see with our own eyes, what we can feel with our own hands. That's the first step now. We're, we're st starting from Hume, but that is the only source of knowledge. It's what we encounter in, in, our, in our empirical world from the senses. Okay, and those things are called phenomena. All right, and it comes from um, 
the Greek word phenomena, which means to show. So it's okay. an object, right? It's like object. Yes, yeah, so this is an object. Well, but there are other objects. There are imaginary objects as well. Right. Okay, so objects that do not appear in the real world, the extended world. Okay, noumenon is an object of thought, reason, or analysis. Okay? So there are other objects besides those objects that appear to us through the senses. These are called noumena. Um, so Plato's ideas or forms would be noumena. Okay? It's always based on the underlying phenomena, and which is directly inaccessible to the mind. So we've got, we've got, we're sort of locked into this situation that Hume created, that Hume described, mm -hmm. in that we are limited by our sense data for what we can know about the world. Even the ideas that we have about the world always will be referred back in some way or another to the actual things that we've encountered in the real world. Even imaginary objects. Can be that the imaginary like abstract because is an abstract is concept directly inaccessible to the mind. Right. Abstract concepts are accessible to the mind. Yes. But they are based upon this stuff. Okay? They are always based upon some phenomenon that we have encountered. Okay? So, noumenon equals the essence equals the thing in itself, if we could get to it. But we can't. And we don't need to. I mean, it's not important that we get to it. Our experience is limited and bounded by the things which, you know, by the rules, by the categories, and by the, uh, the sense data that we get, the empirical work. Okay? Reason, therefore, has any limits to the knowledge it can provide. All right, so he's setting some limits. So now, uh, just to compare the two, ancient East-West and modern Eastern philosophies and cultures are based on religion and revelation. So if we, you know, starting at the 17th century, if we move forward until the late 18th and early 19th centuries, all of the Eastern worlds, China, India, Thailand, Malaysia, you know, in, in, you know Indonesia, Singapore, all of those Eastern worlds are still locked in the old revelatory kind of, you know, world, culture, that they had had for thousands and thousands of years. The Chinese culture is, you know, five, six, seven, eight, who knows, a long time. The Jewish, the Jewish is old, you know, the Indians are old, very old. And they have not changed. They have not changed at all, basically, from the time they were founded until the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Okay, they were very conservative. They minimized any changes. Uh, they were also nihilistic. The next life is always better than this life. This life is the world of suffering. And our only objective is to find a way through it as easily as we can and then leave it at the first possible opportunity. Hopefully in a state of grace. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but the modern West is based on reason and its limits with the renunciation of religion and revelation. We are not, no longer concerned with revelation or any kind of religious knowledge because it provides nothing that will allow us to cope with the actual you know, material world out there, which is constantly changing and constantly in flux, as Heraclitus reminded us. It is the world of becoming that is the most obvious one that we get that we encounter. It is progressive. It wants to maximize inquiry leading to change. It wants to be able to keep up with the changes. And in fact, to begin to guide those changes and make those changes occur when it wants it to. It's positivistic instead of nihilistic. The world of experience, the world, the world of experience, the empirical world is the only world that there is. Okay? How do you say the word nihilistic? Nihilistic. Nihilism Come, comes from nihil, which is a Latin word meaning nothing. So a nihilism is a um, is a debasement of something, whatever it happens to be. We'll see that term in just a little bit, and it will make much more sense. All right. Any questions about where we are at this point in the history of Western and Eastern thought? We're now at the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, early 1800s, okay, with, with Hegel, and 
Uh, we have now had about 300 years, roughly, of progress and change and industrial revolution, you know, building into this from the early 1500s all the way into, you know, the early 1800s. So, any questions about that? We're still living, we still have the two concepts, mm -hmm. spirit, material, mind, body, world, you know, we still are dealing with all of those, because those, those appear to us in our everyday existences. I can imagine things. When I go to sleep at night, you know, I experience a different thing in my dreams. Um, you know, I can meditate and I can actually experience that separation of soul and body. I can actually do all of these things. I can continue to do all of those things. But the attention and the intention in the Western world is now focused not on those things, which are now pretty much, you know, just part of the everyday occurrence of these people. We now want to take everything that we've learned and turn it outward and take a look at the external world and begin to master that external world which is something that the Eastern worlds did not do until they were forced to do so by the Western world. Yeah? This, <clears throat> and this would explain the reason why there's a culture clash, clash between the um, people in the Middle East who are still in the Stone Age, basically, with us who are advanced. <laughs> yes. And, well, Yes. We are. <laughs> yes, exactly. And that's and that's <laughs> yes, and we will we will now begin to investigate exactly what's going on there. Any other comments? But it's not necessarily they're wrong. What? Is that they have an emerged as we have. So it's all all matter is what you have learned, what is the changes, but it's not necessarily they are because their basic is where the whole if the whole thing is started. Is that there? Right. We can, again, we trace our root. Everything starts back in the ancient mystery religions. But the thing is that the, the Eastern world, the Islamic world, the other, those other kinds of places did not move into the world of reason directly. Absolutely. Okay? They are now, were, at the beginning of the 19th century, late 18th, 19th century, they were at a serious disadvantage. Okay? And they still are. Because here is disadvantage. Okay? Anything else? Alright. So, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was born in 1770 and died in 1831. Now, he continues the school of German idealism that was founded by Leibniz Kant. Um, uh, so, this is the German idealism. This is the German idealistic school that is current even today. He was the first phenomenologist. He's going to take Kant's idea um, and use it to describe the world in terms of its phenomena. All right? By no may not. To show, to shine, to appear, to manifest itself. That's the, the Greek root of the word phenomena. So it is that which shows itself, that which reveals itself to us, to our senses. Now, in the phenomenology of spirits, which was his first major word. Okay? And in German, the word spirit, the German word is geist, from which we get our word ghost. Okay? So, the proper translation probably is spirit. So I have here the latest translation, which was by Dr. Findlay, and he uses the term spirit. This is the J.M. Berry translation, which was earlier, and he uses the word mind. So this is a 19th century translation. This is an early 20th century translation. And so uh, the translation itself are pretty much almost identical as far as that goes. But they do, we, they do want to make a distinction between spirit and mind because Hegel makes that distinction, as we'll see in just a second. All right, so in 1807, he publishes the phenomenology of spirit. And the first part is called consciousness. And here he traces out through the phenomenological method, through the dialectical method that he has developed, and building upon Kant and, and um, Leibniz and Spinoza and Hume and Descartes, he comes to the conclusion and demonstrates, according to his method, that spirit interacts with matter according to the categories, and this produces consciousness of phenomena. Now, this is a, this is a unique idea here that's being introduced. Everybody else has sort of been 
you know, before, way back when, they would just assume that there were these two things, that and us. Okay, then Descartes split the two and said, wait a minute, you know, we're not talking about two separate kinds of experience, we're talking about two separate kinds of ontological structure. Okay, then there was the problem of how do these interact? And what Hegel is saying is that they, they occur together. Now, that Kant was also saying this. Everything that happens occurs together. Consciousness is the result of this interaction between spirit and matter. Okay? And this is a unique idea. We'll see this again as we move forward. We'll see this again because this becomes a very important key part of modern philosophy. Can't have one without the other. You cannot have consciousness without an object of consciousness, basically, is the claim here. Okay? So even if I separate my soul from the body and move off into these transcendental realms, I'm still going to be locked in the situation where my consciousness must have an object with which to interact in order for there to be, well, my spirit must have an object in order for there to be consciousness. If there's no object, what happens to consciousness? It is gone. Spirit may still be there, eternal. Mm -hmm. Okay, but consciousness itself is gone. So he's now inserting this separate term, consciousness. He's using it in a unique way at this point. And he's saying it is the interaction. It arises as the interaction between spirit and matter. Okay? He also said the essence of spirit is freedom. The spirit is free, this is not. Okay? And if we go back and compare Plato in the Republic and the Timaeus, he says the soul is more real than matter because it is free. That's the difference between us and that. Okay, we're free, it's not. It can't get up and walk around, it can't change its form. Okay, it can't do any of these things that we can do because we are free. So the essence of spirit is freedom, according to Hegel and according to Plato. Now his method is the Hegelian dialectic. <clears throat> and we'll look at that in just a second. And self-consciousness is the goal of philosophy. The revelation of, one, revelation of one's self as a phenomenon through the dialectic process. All right? And then he suggests in the preface to the phenomenology, he suggests that the study of philosophy occurs through recapitulation of all previous philosophies. So he's saying in order to stand on solid ground in the present epoch, whatever that happens to be, we must go back and recapitulate, that is recreate for ourselves the, philosophy, the philosophical um, world that our predecessors had, and then successively move and recapitulate each successive philosophy until we arrive at our present time, at which point we can then enter into the discussion and maybe shed some light that will lead us further. That's what we're doing here, is we're sort of having a very rapid recapitulation of the high points of all of the previous philosophies. But it's not just an intellectual conception of the previous philosophies, it's an actual lived recapitulation of those philosophies. So you understand the world that Plato saw, the world that Socrates saw. You, you understand the world that the ancient mystery religions saw and experienced. So it's a little more deep than just understanding the terms and everything else. You actually have to do the meditations. You have to practice the uh, psychodrama. You have to do the practice of death. You have to do all of these things that they did to understand what they're talking about. And then as you move successively forward through the epochs, you'll ultimately get to your own epoch, at which point you'll stand on solid ground. Okay? So it's, it's you know, a, a lifetime later. It will never end. Now, the dialectical <laughs> process, he says, because we're sort of dealing with... Um, we're dealing with creating knowledge and consciousness of that knowledge and consciousness of everything that's going on here. And since, since our knowledge is limited at any given point, which Kant demonstrated, we have to use a dialectical process of sort of trial and error to come to the actual truth, sort of, you know, um, um, working our way toward the truth step by step by step by step. And he says that the three poles of that particular dialectical process are, uh, first we have an abstract idea, then we take the negative of that abstract idea, its antithesis, 
and then we look at the concrete results of that process, and then we start over again. Abstract out from the concrete that we've just recognized, negate it, find its antithesis, and then we'll look at the concrete again through this new lens. So a continual refinement of our understanding using these three processes. Okay, so it's trial and error on the phenomenon, the iterative process of revealing contradictions in our understanding of the world. So if we try to understand the way that the world is operating and we encounter a contradiction, we then need to take a step back, abstract out everything from that, to see what the logical structure of that contradiction is. Resolve that contradiction in some way or another, apply it to the concrete world, see if it fits, and then move on from there, continually applying it. So contradiction becomes the key element that tells us we have to apply this process. If there's a contradiction, we need to look further. Okay? Now, this is the way of truth that Parmenides talked about, as opposed to the way of opinion. People who just listen to what Fox News tells us don't go through this process. There are no contradictions for them. Or CNN, or the newspapers, or the New York Times, or our mothers, or our fathers, or our teachers, or anybody else. If you're living in the world of opinion, contradictions do not arise. You simply do what you're told. <clears throat> Only the philosopher is concerned with contradictions and the way of truth. Okay? Does that make sense? This becomes important in just a little while. We'll see why. This process leads to sublation. German was Aufheben and Aufhebung. Um, Aufhebung is the verb, verbal form, the verb form of that. And Aufheben is the... Uh, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, this is the noun, that's the verb. So, and sublation basically means three things, abolish, preserve, and transcend, which is those three, you know, abstract, negative, and concrete. So here we get the concept of this dialectical process that is ongoing. If we want to understand the way the world operates, we have to do these things continuously. Science works this way, through hypothesis, testing, confirmation, retesting, or experimentation and all of that. This is basically the way that we gain knowledge of the extra of the world, of the whole world in which we live. Okay. Um, thesis, antithesis, synthesis is a phrase that is normally associated with Hegel. He never used that particular phrase. It was coined by Heinrich Marx um, Calabeus and was based on Kantian dialectics. And he was he was a um, he followed. Hegel and was an interpreter of Hegel in the German universities. And so he sort of made this stick because his students liked it. It was sort of catchy, <laughs> you know, kind of easy to think about thesis, antithesis, synthesis, and so that's what we get today. But he was Hegel, analytic, right? Pardon me? He was more analytic. Well, this is this is the dialectic process. Dialectic. So it comes from two dia meaning two in Greek, and lexis meaning um, we get our lexicon, words, using the logos, using our reason. So it's two people engaged in a dialogue, okay, revealing the contradictions and coming to a new conclusion. So that's what dialectic means. And so we, we don't necessarily need another human for the dialectic because we can do it ourselves. But that's where it arises from, is that old dialectical process. Okay? Now, part two of the phenomenology of spirit is called self-consciousness. All right, so remember, this is the highest goal of philosophy, is the self-consciousness of the philosopher. So we become conscious of the external world and our relationship to it. Now we have to become conscious of ourselves. Who are we, what are we, and so on and so forth. This requires another consciousness in order for it to be complete. We need to have other humans out there, other consciousness. Okay? However, we immediately run into a major type of contradiction. Because in this relationship between us and other consciousnesses, there is necessarily the, uh, uh, the arising of an inherent relationship of lordship and bondage. Master and slave. Okay? Every relationship, every human relationship, every relationship of a human with another consciousness, like an animal, 
is based upon bondage and lordship. Lordship and bondage. All right, there's going to be those two poles of that relationship. One of them is going to be the Lord, one of them is going to be the slave. Always. And it is in this, the tension that arises between these two poles of the dialectic of self-consciousness that all of history plays itself out in. Okay? He says this persists only because of the slave's fear of death at the hands of the master. Once this fear of death is overcome, the slave will revolt and become the master and enslave others until they revolt. And the process continues. Okay? So this is where Marx and Engels sort of base their, their ideology of Marxism and communism um, on this particular aspect of the Hegelian system. Okay, now this, again, this is not new stuff. It is just now being put in the context of modern philosophy in the Hegelian system itself. Right? Um, and we can take a look at the first man of Thomas Hobbes. Um, and the concept of first man will become important when we talk about the last man. All right, this is the quote from Thomas Hobbes in the Bible. For every man looks that his companion should value him at the same rate he sets upon himself. That is, we want you, I want you to value me as highly as I value myself. And upon all signs of contempt or undervaluing, naturally endeavors, as far as he dares, to extort a greater value from his content, uh, contenders by damage than from others by example. So in other words, in the master-slave relationship, if I don't like the fact that you are trying to you know, one-up me and do all of those things, I may attack you, I may, you know, do all of these subversive kinds of things to attack you subversively, uh, you know, all of these kinds of things. Oh yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so this is the first man, this is the man of the jungle, this is the man of nature, okay, who is simply out there and pursuing his own goals and, you know, gets involved in this, you know, master-slave relationship with other human beings. Okay, this relationship and his two antithetical moments are the dialectic through which he gains self-consciousness. Okay, now we'll compare uh, toward the genealogy of morals with Nietzsche in just a bit, where he talks about master-slave relationships as well. All right, and then later on, Freud's civilization and its discontent, he goes back to Nietzsche and Hegel, and he brings it into a psychoanalytic perspective. and talks about the fact that culture um, creates a, especially modern culture, creates a... Uh, an almost necessary feeling of dread and anxiety and depression and fear in the large portion of the population because they have been forced into a state of slavery. Okay? And anytime they try to break out of that and exert their own freedom, they're slapped down by the authorities. So that is civilization that's discontent then talks about that as being the cause of this sort of universal anxiety that we feel. Okay, now in the philosophy of history, which is here, 1837, this is a, this is a compilation of several um, seminars, uh, courses, that Hegel taught at the university. And so it wasn't published until after his death. It was collated from all the notes of the students, from his notes, and you know, you know, compiled and put together in a pretty good format. World spirit, he talks about the world spirit as the mind of God. Again, <coughs> the laws of nature. Okay? Whatever is compelling us towards the future is, you know, the old concept of the mind of God and the new concept of the laws of nature. We are moving towards a specific end goal. History has a goal. Evolutionary and progressive transcendence of inferior cultures like the Chinese, Indian, Roman, Greek, Egyptian, you know, whatever. Saudi Arabian, whatever. Okay? This is, we have to overcome them. So those are old types. Those are, you know, first level and, well, first order and second order civilizations, which must be transcended and abolished. Because they're not going to get us where we need to be, which is the end goal, a world state which will result in the annihilation of the need for the lordship and bondage relationship and result in maximum freedom for all spirits. That was his vision. A political situation that would provide for us to be free of bondage and lordship relationships 
so that we could all then explore our own freedom. Okay? However, he did admit that the intermediate stages may be bloody and violent as we move towards that. As we annihilate and eliminate the older forms, we'll have to kill a lot of people. All right? So that's why the historical dialectic appears to be the advent of what he called world historical events, which are initiated by world historical figures, such as the French Revolution and Napoleon Bonaparte. So he's, he's actually writing the text of the Phenomenology of the Spirit in 1805. And that is when Napoleon is marching on Europe, the Prussia. Okay? And let me read you what he said in 1806 about Napoleon. Gentlemen, this is a, a lecture of Jenna of 1806. This was the final, the final speech that he gave to his students in 1806. We find ourselves in an important epoch, in a fermentation, in which spirit... Okay, the mind of God, our spirit, has made a leap forward, has gone beyond its previous concrete form and acquired a new one. The whole mass of ideas and concepts that have been current until now, the very bonds of the world are dissolved, and collapsing into themselves like a vision in a dream. A new emergence of spirit is at hand. Philosophy must be the first to hail its appearance and recognize it, while others, resisting impotently, adhere to the past, and the majority unconsciously constitute the matter in which it makes its appearance. The philosophy, uh, but philosophy and recognizing it as what is eternal, must pay homage to it. In other words, the violence, the destruction, the blood, all of that is necessary in order for the world spirit to complete its task. And philosophy should stand up and say, yep, that's good, that's good, because that's what we need in order to advance to the next level. And it doesn't matter if a lot of people die. Because that's necessary in order for us to ultimately attain the end of history. Okay? The, what? the end of history. This oh, wow. perfect utopia. Yeah? So, uh, is the kingdom of spirit when we all go back to the spirit? No, no, he's saying it's here. It's here in the real world. In the, yeah, what we consider the real world. Yeah, the material world. The world, because you remember, he's now abolished that distinction. There is the only world we have, the only world we can encounter is the world here, this. This is it. There's only one world and this is it. It does happen to arise because we are spirit and it is matter, but that combines to give us the consciousness of the world that is the only world. There's no way around this. There's no way away from it. There's no escape. There's no need for escape because this is where all the action is. Okay? So there's no nihilism here. This is a positive vision. Positive coming from the word to posit, to, you know, to, to position, to take a position on. Okay, we'll see that term a little bit later, too, as a technical term. Okay? So it's a positive world. This is it. This is the only world we live in. There's no escape from it. There's no need to escape from it. Everything is happening according to a plan by the world spirit, this evolutionary trend towards whatever it is that we're moving towards. And it is taking place in these violent confrontations between the older cultures and the newer cultures. And of course, it has to play out in the material form of human beings that are engaged in this struggle between the older. Yeah, okay? It is happening. I mean, keep on happening. Yes, okay? So that was the epigraph to Coget's introduction to the reading of Hegel. Now, Coget will be important in just a second. Okay, with Hegel, modern philosophy becomes uh, more and more political, more and more obviously political. And there is an overt rendering of the concept of progress into philosophy which was missing from the ancients, except, of course, for Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, who are talking about reason and progress and all these things. And it was still missing from the modern Eastern cultures until the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So, does this answer our question from an earlier seminar about what happened to cause the divergence? between East and West in the 17th century. Sure does. Okay, we're trying to explain what happened there. And what happened there was that with Descartes, there was a turn back towards reason and back towards um, what we would now consider to be the scientific method. And that put the Western world, Europe in particular, at a huge advantage over the rest of the planet. 
and the rest of the planet never caught up and still hasn't caught up. What we are experiencing right now is the end game of that particular turn. And the lack of evolution is actually what is the, the fiction, right? Evolution by them, by their part. Evolution, yes, exactly. They did not evolve. And therefore they must be discarded violently. Okay, that is, the, that is the basis of evolutionary theory. That which does not, that which does not deserve to survive won't survive. <laughs> okay, in the natural world, you know, it happens because nature just basically terminates the line. In the world of human beings, it happens because we go out and exterminate people that we... I think the new generations in, in, in <coughs> Europe, they are, have access to other countries, they are reinforcing this conflict even more mm -hmm. to arise and to they want to be part of the evolution. But then again, the culture is, is such a big fight. Mm -hmm. And when they don't have the spiritual freedom, so they don't have the spiritual freedom. Mm -hmm. They want to have it, but mm -hmm. they don't. Mm -hmm. And that is the big mm -hmm. crushing. Well, yes, and we'll see, we'll, later on, we'll see exactly how that comes about, okay? Hegel is trying to tell us that there is some kind of transcendent world spirit out there that is driving this, okay? The old mind of God that is driving this. Remember that with Spinoza, we are accidental. It doesn't matter whether he, we as individuals are here, okay? It doesn't matter whether I'm here or you're here as individuals. Everything continues. The mind of God continues, nature continues, you know, history continues without us. Mm -hmm. We are accidents. We're not important to this whole concept. And that gets embedded in this whole, this whole line of reasoning that we're thinking about. The individual is not important. It is the mind of God. It is the, the world spirit that is important. We are simply accidental elements of that, you know, progress towards whatever it is. are thinking of the government. Right. Exactly. That's exactly what's going on. All right. Any questions or comments? All right. Let me change the, the tape here.